Hey everybody, welcome to the program. Well, you have been asking for it, and now I'm delivering. Today I'm talking about Revolver by the Beatles, and we're going to pit the USA version against the UK pressing to determine which is the superior 1966 album. Let's begin. So first off, Revolver is very important for the Beatles as it marks a turning point in their career as a band. It combines the best of their pop rock sound with the beginnings of their more experimental, psychedelic sound that would become much more present in their later work. In my opinion, three major factors shaped the sound for this record. The first is, you gotta understand, the Beatles were coming off this crazy schedule. They somehow found time to record six albums and star in two films, all while performing on a nearly non-stop world tour. This was all within a three and a half year period. I think it's safe to say they were tired. <laughs> I mean, with that schedule, they barely had time for themselves. So it comes as no surprise that they took a three month break after their last concert of 1965 before returning to the studio in April of 66, ultimately feeling refreshed. Secondly, during this break, they decided to stop touring altogether, playing their last nine gigs in 1966 with their final 10th performance as a band taking place on January 30th, 1969 on the rooftop of Apple Records. I think that the relief of not having to perform live anymore gave the Beatles a much needed freedom in the recording studio. Suddenly, they were able to experiment with studio effects such as speed manipulation, reverse, even employing sound effects. These recording techniques would be nearly impossible to recreate live with 1966 technology. The last factor was the presence of engineer Jeff Emmerich. He previously worked with them as a second engineer, but when their regular engineer Norman Smith was busy working with Pink Floyd, the job fell to Jeff. He was only 20 at the time, and this was his first gig as a head engineer, so he wasn't set in his ways. He was open to the Beatles' experimentation, and I think they fed off of his youthful energy energy and can-do attitude. A match made in heaven, really. I would encourage you guys to read up on him. He has a whole book written about his experience working with the Beatles. Recording for the album wrapped up by the end of June 1966, and it was released a little over a month later on August 5th in the UK and on August 8th in the US. <laughs> All right, guys, real quick, I just want to point out that while this is an original 1966 U.S. pressing, my U.K. copy is from 2014, but they recreated it almost exactly how it was made back in 1966. So right off the bat, both covers look almost identical. The only main difference is right here, the logos for the respective record labels. You have Capital here and Parlophone there. I much prefer the UK pressing as the US version has this weird kind of funky border along the edge here, the top, and this little note that says file under the Beatles. I never understood why Capital insisted on printing how to organize their record for shop owners. I mean, isn't this stuff kind of self-explanatory? I mean, where else would you file them, really? The point is, this unnecessary border cuts off the cover art, especially towards the top, infringing on the brilliant design by artist Klaus Vormann. Despite this, Klaus went on to win a Grammy for this cover. On the back here, again, very similar, same photograph, very similar layout. The UK copy actually lists track numbers. The US copy does not. I think the way the UK crafted their covers with these flaps made them inherently stronger than the US style, which was at this time basically two slabs of cardstock with a thin paper strip holding them together. Not only is this much weaker, but over time you start to get seam splits from hastily pulling your record in and out of the sleeve. While the construction of the UK pressing is superior, aesthetically, I don't like it. I much prefer the US back cover. I think the best of both worlds is the 1973 UK pressing that uses a different manufacturing technique so that these flaps actually go on the inside and you have an all black cover, which I think is really sharp looking. Overall, it's a draw between the two. Me being in the US, I really like these UK covers because we never got these over here. And I just think they're really cool from that perspective. While both the UK and the US versions contain the same songs in the same order, the US version is short three songs, leaving a total of 11 tracks versus the UK's 14. That in itself wouldn't be so bad, but the fact that Capital left off track three on side one, I'm Only Sleeping, is unforgivable. I'm only 
This is one of my favorites off this album. For me, it's not Revolver without I'm Only Sleeping. The reason Capitol omitted this song from their version is because it was released earlier on the infamous 1966 album Yesterday and Today, along with two other Revolver tracks, Dr. Robert and Your Bird Can Sing. As to why Capitol did this, I have no idea. My only guess would be money. More Beatles albums equal more money. If you guys have any insight, please let me know. Jumping back to track two on side one, a song that needs no introduction, you all know it, Eleanor Rigby. Eleanor Rigby picks up the rice in the church where a wedding has been. Oh man, do I love this song. It must have been something to do with those strings. Incidentally, none of the Beatles are playing instruments on the track. They only sing on it. The music is provided by a string octet playing a score written by producer George Martin. Eleanor Rigby was the first single off the album and it was released as a double A side along with Yellow Submarine, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We all live in a yellow submarine, yellow submarine. Oh, this song is so awesome. One of my favorites since I was a kid. It's the perfect sing-along song. It's also one of the first songs I learned to play on guitar. It's a total jam, by the way. You guys should pick up a guitar and play it. You can tell the Beatles are really having fun on this song, singing through tin cans, employing sound effects. The album ends with Tomorrow Never Knows. What an amazing song! It's so good and incredibly influential. This song could be released today and it would be a hit. In fact, it sort of was. Anyone hear the similarities between this and the Chemical Brothers track, Let Forever Be? Tomorrow Never Knows was originally titled The Void, but that was decided to be a little too esoteric, so John decided to use one of Ringo's funny sayings from an interview they did back in 1964. So you can't blame me, you know, what can you say? What can you say? Oh, yeah. Tomorrow okay. Never Knows. The song was inspired by the book, The Psychedelic Experience, a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Wow, this book even had a chapter on how to take a trip. I kid you not, it was basically a how-to guide for taking LSD and Lennon followed it to a T. By the time the song was recorded, John had taken three LSD trips. So this song is really about taking acid, unlike Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. What's even more interesting is that this was actually the first song recorded for the album. Symbolically, what a track to start off your album with. It really set the tone for what the Beatles were going to do from then on. There was no turning back, man. After this song, wow, it was such a remarkable departure from anything they had done prior to that. Think about it. In four years, they went from Love Me Do to this. Talk about pushing the envelope. I mean, this is why we are still talking about the Beatles today. What a remarkable group they were. Well, if you haven't guessed it by now, the UK version is the best, by far, simply because the US version is missing three songs. And it's the album the Beatles intended, not what Capitol thought they could sell. The US version is cool if that's what you grew up with and that's all you can find since they're very common here in the US, but it's just not the same record. If you love this album, you really owe it to yourself to pick up a UK copy. So, if you're looking for a UK copy, original pressings in good condition can be pricey, especially if you live in the US where they are much harder to come by. It might be best to look for a later pressing or do what I did and grab the 2014 mono reissue. It sounds glorious and what's great is that they actually mastered it from the original source tapes. As far as I know, no digital steps were taken. The best part is, they cost around 20 bucks new. Well, that'll do it for this time around. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below. I am your Vinyl Geek and I'll catch you on the flip side. Welcome to the annotation part of the video. 
Now, if you're looking for more episodes on the Beatles, well, I got them right here. Click away. I got episodes on their debut, Please Please Me, Sgt. Pepper's, Hard Day's Night, even Rubber Soul. Go ahead, I dare you. Click away. I'm just gonna sit here and enjoy my uh, drink here. I didn't make a drink for this episode. I'm sorry, guys. It just, I had a lot of things going on on my plate. And you know what? I got plenty of Beatles content, so enjoy. That was a lot of straw. I didn't need that much straw in my mouth. <laughs>